All right, well, thanks for uh, uh, looking in today. I have with me uh, John Fia from Maasai University. Uh, this is a series of interviews that I've been doing to help me reflect on 15 years of blogging. Uh, John is also a blogger. He's, uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, John is a distinguished professor of history at Maasai University in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania, across the state. He's been there since uh, 2002. He's the author of six books, uh, Was America Founded as a Christian Nation? And uh, Historical Introduction is one of my favorite books. And then his most recent book is Believe Me, The Evangelical Road to Donald Trump, which is a very timely, very timely book. Uh, and we'll talk about court evangelicals here in a, in a little bit. He's a very prolific writer. He's been published in The Atlantic. Uh, Washington Post, USA Today, among uh, many other places. And he blogs at The Way of Improvement Leads Home. Uh, and I'd like to uh, have you tell the story of that title uh, a little later uh, as we talk. Uh, John's been on all the networks. Uh, he's uh, been on US uh, or on uh, CNN and MSNBC. Uh, never been on the Food Network, though. I don't think. Never will either. Warren. Never will. Um, I'm not a foodie. I don't. Uh, I, I don't cook. I can make eggs, grilled cheese, you know that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, that'll okay. be that. My career has to take a really different turn for me to ever be on the Food, <laughs> food Network. Well, you know, I never thought I would be uh, doing any history. I mean, I'm not sure that yeah. what what I do is Who called knows? history, but I, you know, I'm more of a fact checker. Yeah. But uh, who knows where, where you'll go. It's true. It's uh, true. There, there is uh, all kinds of variety in life. Uh, now, have you been on Fox News? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I've been invited to be on Fox News um, once, maybe even twice in the last three years. Um, and I can't remember the exact issue. I'm not opposed to going on Fox News, but, but, they invited me at a, at a particular moment when Fox News was peddling an incredibly false narrative about something with the current administration. Believe that, you know, can you believe that, right? Um, and I just, I didn't feel comfortable with the, with how they were going to set me up as the kind of anti-Fox News, anti-Trump guy, and it seemed like an ambush. So, uh, and, and I think it was an issue related to race where I did not even want to, uh, to, to acknowledge the narrative they were pushing. So I said, no, but I have been invited. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, maybe someday. Who knows? I'm open to, you know, depending on the issue I'd go on, but in this case, it was just too, it was just too much for me. Yeah. All right. Well, we first became acquainted uh, as far as I recall over email. Uh, in fact, I looked, I looked, uh, looked it up in late May, early June, 2011. Sounds right. Um, yeah, I sent you a post uh, debunking something David Barton had written about John Adams and the Holy Spirit. I think uh, David yeah. Barton said that uh, John Adams was serious when he said uh, the Holy Spirit was involved in government. Yeah. And uh, I, I uh, had plugged your book in the in the post, and I was also hoping that you might say what you thought of it. And uh, you wrote back and said you'd, you know, read some of my blog posts, which made my day. Uh, and, and that, you know, I found out we were really on the same page uh, when it came to yeah. Barton and the American founding and, you know, many of those issues. And so when it comes to, to Barton, and, you know, we kind of got a, a quick connection based on that. As a Christian in history, uh, was Barton always on your radar? Is, yeah. Was he somebody that came up in your education, graduate education at all? Or how did you it's, get it, connected to him? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, Barton, obviously, I didn't read Barton. I didn't I never heard of Barton until I got to teach, started teaching evangelical students at Messiah. And, you know, I don't hear much about Barton from my students today, but back in uh, the the mid 2000s, I had a lot of students, you know, a lot, maybe a handful 
who would who would bring things to me written by Barton. And, you know, a lot of them were be, you know, were kind of like my dad gave me this because I'm a history major, you know, what do you think of this or this, you know, this my church is doing this and I recognized right away what Barton is do, was doing because Barton was is not unique. I mean, there's there's a kind of uh, you know historiographical history here. Um, I I see David Barton as um, the natural extension of of some other people that were doing pretty much the same thing uh, in the late seventies and eighty early eighties with the rise of the moral majority and and the idea that America was founded as a Christian nation. So I did growing you know as I grew as a scholar and and as a Christian uh, I read people like Mark Knoll, George Marsden, Nathan Hatch. They wrote a great book in 80 or 81, mm, I think, right. called The Search for Christian America. And what they were doing was they were challenging an earlier manifestation of Barton, which was, you know, the, the Jerry Falwell, D. James Kennedy, um, all of these, you know, the, 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 uh, the um, reconstructionists of the world, like Rush Dooney and, and Ga is it Gary North, I think is his first name. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, who were arguing this sort of Christian nationalism, Christian nation, Christian nationalism was not being used then. It was just this idea America was a Christian, Christian founded as a Christian nation. And I always thought that book kind of solved the issue, right? It, it debunked this and a lot of it was being filtered through the writings at the time a lot of the the pol politicians invoking history uh was filt you know they were filtering their ideas through uh francis schaefer um who towards the end of his career was writing sort of very strong in a very strong kind of christian nation um strain in some of his late last books you know uh, so so Schaefer was influencing Falwell. You know, if you want to get this history, I encourage you to read Barry Hankins' biography of Francis Schaefer. He gets into all of this, um, this detail in, in one of the last chapters of the book. But Noel Hatch, Marsden, they were challenging this. And, you know, I had read this and, you know, I had, I thought, you know, for many Christian intellectuals or thinking, even not intellectual, even thinking Christians, um, Hatch, Noel, and Marsden sort of slayed the beast, right? I mean, they, they proved that, you know, no, no, what the Christian right is, 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 is putting out there is, uh, is, is wrong. Um, it's, it's a faulty view of history. And we could get into some of the details when we talk specific, more specifically about Barton maybe, but they slayed the beast for some people, but they didn't slay the political beast that had been created. So in some ways, Noel Hatch, what I mean by that is Noel Hatch and Marston sort of, while they made, uh, you know, they made an initial stab at this and they convinced a lot of thoughtful Christians, they didn't kill it completely, maybe, you know, so maybe the slaying idea is a bad metaphor I'm using. But so, so it opened up the door for then a next generation of Christian nationalists, uh, I hate even to call them historians. If you read my blog, you'll notice I always refer to people like David Barton as GOP activists or Christian mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. activists who use the past to promote their political agenda, right? Yeah. I'm always really <laughs> hesitant to, to use the term historian. <laughs> but, um, but Barton then was the second sort of the next wave of this. And um, that's where as soon as my students started bringing uh, this guy, David Barton, to my attention, people in my church, right? I go to an evangelical, sort of evangelical free church, sort of a mainstream evangelical mm -hmm. denomination. They were like, what do you think of this? You know, and I thought, it, th it's back, right? I mean, you know, this is, this is kind of rising again from the ashes. And, you know, it's attracting, it's attracting people. It's people are listening to him. So, so that's my introduction to Barton. And then I started reading him and realized just how kind of bad on multiple levels his history was. That, so the, I think that's a great point that this is cyclical in a way that, uh, yeah. that so there, there's during the generation of those earlier historians that you talked about, they, they took on the beast and yeah. maybe they wounded it wounded but, is probably better yeah yeah and so they but they did battle you know they engaged yeah. the that particular 
contest. So what keeps it alive and, and how does it keep coming back? Uh, that's what, uh, uh, you, you know, I've, I've puzzled over is, is they did such a good job too. I mean, that, that book was a good book and it, it really seemed like it was definitive. And then, yeah. and then, you know, you come along and you have to do the same thing, it seems, yeah. but in a slightly different way. So Barton comes along, does he just repackage it? Is, yeah. yeah. I, first of all, you know, let me say something about the own, my, the own limitations of my own work in trying to counter this. And maybe, you know, you can speak for yourself, Warren, but maybe the limitations of even your, your work, right? Uh, you know, we're getting somewhere. We're convincing more people. But the beast is still alive, right? Right. you know. And 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 I'm imagining in 20 years somebody's going to be saying the exact same thing. I'll just speak for myself of my own work, right? So so that leads to your question, right? Why this cyclical pattern? What's fascinating is it is a relatively new pattern, because I, I think this kind of debate over whether or not America is founded as a Christian nation or not really does not begin until. Um, you know, you see the rise of the Christian right in the moral majority. Prior to, say, 1975 or 1980, uh, this was not a debate, right? And largely because um, white evangelicals still held some kind of cultural power, right, in America. In other words, uh, mm -hmm. prayer in public schools, Bible reading in public schools, um, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, the, they, their segregated academies were, were not being touched. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, immigration patterns were, were different, right? The 1965 yes. Immigration Act brought in all these diverse people, right? right? That's right. So, so remember, the Christian right uh, emerges in response to all this to try to reclaim, restore, renew uh, America. And, you know, what, so then you have to ask, like, what is the America we're trying to renew? So you begin to see these, these uh, activists going back, these, these GOP Christian right activists going back into the past and trying to construct what I would call a largely imagined kind of past, a golden age, if you will, that never existed, that somehow we have to go back to, right? So um, I think inherent within all of us, whether it be Christian people or not, or Christian right or not, is this longing for this usable past we historians call, right? Um, you know, you see on the left, you see people like Howard Zinn, and, and that may be familiar to some of your listeners, these kind of radical leftist historians, right, who are tapping into this as well, right? We need to find, you know, how Columbus was a, you know, engaged in genocide and, you know, all of this kind of stuff. This is the past we want to tell. And I think that kind of past kind of cherry picks, right? You know, the things you need to make your point in the present. And we're always doing that. It's a natural inclination for all of us to do that, right? We pick what we need to make our point. We don't look and see the past in all its complexity and all its fullness and so forth. So I think this is going to be something that's always with us, this usable past. And it was with us prior to the Christian, right? In other ways, right? People use the past. So the, the more, but I think the more uh, Christianity becomes uh, threatened, and I put that in quotes because, I, you, know, you know, there's this sense of victimization that a lot of the Christian right has, right? That we're losing our culture, we're losing our way of life. Um, I think the more we become a, plur a more pluralistic society, the less white we become, as a nation, the more diverse we become as a nation, uh, most in the Christian right do not want to celebrate that kind of diversity because they're very fearful of losing something. Um, and thus, whenever people are driven by this kind of fearful, uh, this fear, they, they become nostalgic for something and, and they then turn to the past. So I think, I think you saw the initial thrust of that in the late 70s and 80s in the Reagan era, especially, right? 
Um, and then, you know, and now you're seeing it again. It's, it's even more acute now because we're, we're even more diverse. Questions of race, questions of diversity are even more at the fore. So there's this kind of doubling down even or tripling down or whatever, you know, to try to, uh, to, try to uh, make sure that we reclaim America. Um, you know, so, so I think that explains the cyclical pattern. Now we'll see what happens, how long it will continue, right? I mean, we don't know what the next generation is going to look like. You know, they tell us the next generation is much more interested in uh, questions of, uh, you know, social justice or the environment, or, you know, they're not necessarily looking for a mythic past anymore. They've rejected the, the, the sort of Christian right agenda, at least some of them have, right? Um, you know, is there going to be a need to reclaim this again? Will there be a third kind of cycle, if you will? If you talk, you know, if you look at what's happening with David Barton right now in his wall builders organization, he is clearly preparing for this next generation because it's clear he's, as you know, I'm sure, Warren, and see he's nurturing his son, Tim, mm -hmm. uh, to be the kind of, uh, the, you know, the kind of carry on the mantle. Right. Right, and and that that leads me to uh, to wonder if you've, if you've seen any uh, people who might be stepping up outside of you know beyond his yeah. son. Uh, are there younger people? Um, and just to kind of get you started on that, I'm thinking yeah. of someone like a Charlie Kirk. Yeah. yeah. Uh, do you see others yeah. that might uh, Candace Owen or somebody like that? Well, I think I think there is there. You know, I would separate. I would separate Barton from these kinds of political uh, pundits because Barton does peddle in the past. He does his shtick, right? Is is the past, right? You know, pulling out a document or whatever. Um, I think I think people like Candace Owens, Charlie Kirk, uh, Liberty University's new center, the Falkirk Center, which seems to be now becoming a place where you're seeing a lot of this. Um, you know, many of the evangelical supporters for Donald Trump, uh, Greg Laurie, the megachurch pastor uh, uh, in um, California, who has a huge following, I, I hear him making more and more references in his sermons lately and in his social media to, to American history. Um, now, again, he's, he's in his 60s, you know, or late 60s. Mm -hmm. But so, so, um, you know, I don't see anybody kind of engaging in the kind of more, the more historical part of it, but they all draw on Barton, right? You know, they don't have to, they don't have to do that work because Barton's doing it for them. I also notice, I, you know, again, I watch this very closely. So I, I have noticed a kind of subtle change in, in Barton, in, in the wall builders, right, approach over the last five years or so, or maybe less than that, couple of years. Um, you know, Barton started out really advocating for this idea that America was founded as a Christian nation, um, and we need to get back to that. Um, I think he still believes that, but he doesn't use that rhetoric anymore. He, he seldom talks about America being founded as a Christian nation. Uh, Instead, he talks about kind of Judeo-Christian principles in the founding, which is slightly kind of different, right? Um, it's the same way of saying it, but it's a different kind of rhetoric. I see his son, Tim Barton, being much more open to kind of saying things like, these people were flawed or, you know, it's hard, it's hard not to, especially in light of uh, the wake of the, the Floyd killing, it's hard not to kind of now, you know, to simply say these people, you know, ignore their, their racial problems, right? So I've lately been seeing Tim Barton saying, well, these people are flawed, these people are, but we still have to you know, look at them. We don't. We shouldn't tear down their statues, or we shouldn't. Uh, we shouldn't criticize them, right? Um, because we're all flawed, right? And and then you get into these weird kind of jumps into theology, right? Jesus redeemed us, and why should we call? You know, you know, why should we tear down or erase history, right? Which is just crazy stuff. Um, but I also notice there is a new emphasis on um, teachers. Uh, there has been a, there has been in the last twenty years uh, a a in the general educational sort of history education a major movement towards providing 
um, teachers with with content and with um, uh, resources for their continuing education. The Gilder Lehrman Institute out of New York is huge at this. I've done some work for them. Um, you see this in uh, uh, back in the Bush era, Bush two era, uh, the, the um, American history grants that they gave out, the teaching, uh, what were they called? Teaching American history grants, millions of dollars infused into school districts uh, to strengthen civic and American history education. Uh, actually, it was Obama who got rid of that right? Obama was much more interested in STEM than he was in American mm -hmm. history. But I see, I see now wall builders are having these uh, teacher seminars where they bring people to Alito, Texas, right. uh, and, and they, they teach them sort of the true history, right? Um, so, so they may be modeling this after some of these other initiatives. So, so that's something that, the, that, that Barton didn't do in the past. Barton was always, the, the, the father, I mean, was always all about kind of his tours of Washington, D.C., the monument, you know, pointing out how, you know, it says in God we trust here and, you know, taking you on a capital tour. Um, and, uh, and his son seems to be moving in a, just a slightly different direction. Yeah. Well, you got to pay the bills. There may be some uh, money in seminars uh, that may be part of it. Now, you know, I'm thinking of some other uh, people, uh, not necessarily young people, but other figures. And I think of uh, maybe uh, Dinesh D'Souza, who, uh, you know, wants a usable past. And then uh, our good buddy, Eric Metaxas. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, he he says David Barton's a great historian. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, my favorite, my favorite line came, I don't know if you've done, I don't know, I don't know if I've, if there's been people in between me uh, and Greg Thornberry in this series, or maybe there have, but <laughs> yeah. when Greg Thornberry <laughs> said that Eric Metaxas died in 12, 2012 and his body has been taken over, what do you say, by aliens or something like that? That was just an incredible line. I would probably, I would probably nuance that even more and say, um, you know, from the from the perspective of scholars, uh, Eric Metaxas has been pretty consistent even before 2012. His Bonhoeffer biography has been largely panned by by Bonhoeffer's historian. So I'm not sure there was necessarily a break in 20, 2012. <laughs> but I see what Greg's saying, and I I, I agree. <laughs> you know, I agree with what Greg is saying. Um, you mentioned Dinesh D'Souza. Um, Dinesh D'Souza. You know, I don't think he's getting his stuff from. Uh, for Barton, I think he's too proud for that. I think he thinks he himself is a is a you know a, a great historian of some sort. I would encourage you to Google um, uh, Dinesh D'Souza and Kevin Cruz, who is a Princeton University historian who has uh, just used his Twitter feed to sort of tear D'Souza to shreds, mm -hmm. especially, to, you know, th this is, this is lately a really weird thing. I don't want to get too, too much, too, too much off on this, but there's this really weird argument that's being made right now. And D'Souza is at the heart of it that, you know, the democratic party of the late 19th and 20th century was white, believed in white supremacy and were racists, which is true, mm -hmm. especially in the South, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and then, as a result, the Democratic Party today is the real party of racism, not the Republican Party. It's just terrible historical thinking. It rejects everything we teach our students about change over time and how parties change and so forth. But the Sousa has been pushing that narrative hard, and fortunately, we have someone with the stature of a Kevin Cruz at Princeton who's been pushing back on that. Um, Metaxas. I, you know, I don't know. I don't know what to make of that guy. I mean, he's 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 become just a, a sort of caricature of uh, a sort of Trump culture warrior who will do will manipulate facts and do anything possible to be able to. You know, he recently came out and said Jesus was white. You know, yeah. I, I think I think he's playing with us. I think part of it is just trolling, right, to try to get people like me to, to or you or someone else to kind of attack him and say ha, ha, ha you know <laughs> he's got a weird sense of humor he every time he every time he makes a historical comment like you know how he compared Hillary Clinton to Hitler and you know he comes up with these outrageous historical claims he comes back with oh I was just joking right I'm like well 
you know, we could make a list of Eric Metaxas' tweets. And, you know, this is a pretty consistent pattern. Like, it's not funny, right? <laughs> you know, especially in this moment, right? Um, you know, so, so uh, you know, he and Barton seem to have developed a close relationship. I always thought that Metaxas was a little more intellectually sophisticated to be able to realize the flaws in David Barton's work. But then, it, you know, it just shocked me. I think this was maybe a couple of years ago. I probably blogged about it when Barton came on Metaxas' show and he did say that. He said, I think you said, it, you are the greatest historian working today and, you know, so on and so forth. I mean, I mean, back maybe five or six years ago, there was a, a poll taken of American historians, not Christian or otherwise, just straight up American historians working in all kinds of fields, museums, academics, mm -hmm. um, you know, and they, they, they voted, and you know, I know you know this, Warren, they voted, um, and I see the book behind you, they voted uh, Barton's Jefferson Lies, right, as the the what was it the worst history book the worst sort of, history book yeah martin was the is it's the crazy. worst historian working today you know i mean it's all and and so so you know metaxas is peddling peddling this kind of you know really bad narrative um if i could just say one more thing about yeah. barton and metaxas and all yeah. of this stream i mean you know this better than me right you know i mean on one level they get facts wrong mm -hmm. right and and your book um and Professor Coulter's book uh, th that debunked this is really, really useful. I think I blurbed it, right? You know, I, right. you know, it's you broke it down. You did the digging, and and yeah, they get they get all kinds of facts wrong. So that's you know, but for me as a historian, the problem goes even deeper than just the facts. I would say the majority of things that I see David Barton say are actually true. They're they're accurate, right? Mm -hmm. um, what bothers me is the way he manipulates the facts to serve, as I mentioned this already, to serve sort of political ends. So, you know, what he says is true, but he doesn't think like a historian. He, and, and, you know, I think, I think historians think about the past in a certain way. They think about it in terms of context. They think about change over time. They think about the complexity of the figures, right? We call these the five C's of historical thinking, right? They think about contingency and causation. You know, I wrote about this in a book called Why Study History that I wrote uh, about seven or eight years ago. Um, all of this, you know, the, his, the past is not just frozen in time for you to go back and take it and then just say, boom, let's apply it. Let's apply the 1776 to 2020, right? As if nothing happened in between. That to me is even more dangerous than kind of getting the facts wrong. Because we now live in an age in which the facts are now easily checkable, right? I mean, people have the internet, right? They could say, no, this is not right. You know, they can go to a reliable website or something. There's a lot of bad websites too, right? But they could check the facts. It's how you use the facts and manipulate the facts, I think, that are, that are the problem. And I think Barton doesn't understand what happens as much as he wants to bring American history into schools. Like I even saw Metaxas recently on his Facebook page say, I, you know, I want my book. I'm trying to figure out a way to get my book, if you can keep it, in the hands of every American school teacher, right? Well, I wrote a, I wrote a five or six, oh you know, blogs, long blog posts, which Metaxas mentioned on his program, said something like, some guy wrote a six, you know, he yeah. doesn't acknowledge I exist. Every right. time he, some guy. Every, you know, every time uh, John Ward from Yahoo News asked him about me once and he completely, like, he wouldn't even call me my name. He wouldn't even mention my name, right? right. Mr. Fia right. thinks that, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he said I was unpatriotic or whatever. So I did a post with, on my blog with a picture of me waving an American flag. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, Barton and Metaxas, they want their stuff in schools. They have no, and, and I would make the same case about, say, like those on the left, like the 1619 Project or whatever. You know, forcing this stuff into schools kind of, you know, saying is, is totally misunderstands what happens in a history classroom. And it's insulting to teachers. Because it's this idea that like, 
if we can just get our stuff in schools by osmosis somehow, you know, um, our students will read this and then they will believe that we're a Christian nation, right? No history teacher gives material and then doesn't teach it critically, right? Are there good things about this? Are there bad things about this, right? I mean, to, to suggest that, that, you know, and I think the left does this too. If you just get the 1619 curriculum in the schools, then the whole racism problem might be solved. Well, you know, there's some problems with the 1619 project as well right? But the, the, the teacher is there to, to, to moderate and to get, you know, I would say put 1619 Project up against David Barton's view of slavery and have a discussion and a debate. That's what happens in a, in a history classroom, not this kind of like do, indoctrination. First of all, as you know, we're both professors, Warren. Like, are the students even going to do the reading in the first place? <laughs> you know, are they, you know, can we even trust? Like, here, That's if you optimistic. read... Yeah, if you read the 1619 Project or if you read David Barton, you will be indoctrinated, right? Well, that assumes that these students are going to read it. That they care, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. so I think he totally misses that idea. It's this kind of, I think American history is very, very good for civics, mm -hmm. right? We obviously, it's the, the, the U.S. history serves a role in terms of civics, but you know, it also teaches these skills about how to think contextually, how to think about change over time, com the complexity of the human experience. I think all of these things also have a kind of civic role because they, they teach people how to be critical thinkers. When they pick up the newspaper, right, they say, okay, who wrote this? How does, how does the New York Times coverage right. of this differ from the Wall Street Journals? Mm -hmm. Right, this creates democratic citizens. So, you know, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going off on a tangent here, but, but that, is my, that is one of the big dangers of people like David Barton on this front. Well, yes, and so you anticipated uh, one of my questions, uh, which is, why do we do this? You know, why do we go into the fact checking? First of all, we yeah. wanna, you know, show that there's a, an agenda here. There's something behind this it's not just to teach history or to make us educated there's a, a there's a real agenda to come up with a usable past as you've talked about it and beyond the usable past to get you to think a certain way there's a desire to get you to do certain things yeah. to vote certain ways yeah. to uh, live certain ways as citizens and uh, that's really what matters to the ideologue well, let's just let's just take it from the perspective of you know since we're talking about Bart and Metaxas so on and so forth right you know this is all politically driven mm -hmm. um, and these people have large followings right this gets back to the discussion that we had early in our early here in this in this uh, in this conversation right about um, slaying the beast right. People like you and me and others, we don't have the institutional structures that um, people like Metaxas and Barton have. We don't have the money. We don't have the donors. Like I always joke, like, like I think history is very, very complex, right? My Christian America book argued that the relationship between religion and the founding is a very, very complex story, right? No one wants to fund the complexity. <laughs> right? No one, you know, I mean, I remember when I would go on the radio programs for that book, I would go on Christian radio or, or, or right wing radio, they'd invite me on, right? Because they'd see maybe, I don't know, the title of the book was Red, White and Blue and the first edition or, you know, they thought I was going to make a case for Christian America because I taught at a place called Messiah College, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the first question was, you know, so the title of my book, right, was America founded as a Christian nation? Question mark. So you can imagine what the first First question they would ask is right what was it was it and i'd say you know it's complicated and then like there was no it was almost like everything shut down like there was no need to be for me to even be on the program like why are you here right you know you're not gonna you're not gonna feed our our narrative like what's the you know what's the point point? And, and they didn't honestly you could almost sense it they didn't know what to ask after that right because they thought i was there to kind of you know push some kind of some kind of agenda so so no one wants to fund those kinds of things. The big donors and so forth want to fund either something on the far left or the far right. Um, I don't know what kind of financial shape 
people like wall builders are, but wall built, you know, if they're, if they're getting donations, Eric Metaxas has a national audience on Salem radio, you know, he's right in there with all the, I don't, you know, who was Hugh Hewitt and, you know, Michael Medved and all these, uh, you know, Gallagher and all these other guys. I mean, that's hard to fight against, you know, I mean, you know, I have a Patreon page for my work. Um, you know, and I get a few hundred bucks, you know, <laughs> but, you know, I'd love to be able to expand the reach, but it, it just, that'll pay for the to... server. Yeah. That'll pay yeah. for the server. So it's, yeah. so I think that's, that's, um, but, but the, the point being is that back to your initial point, right? If you are going to promote a Christian right agenda, if you want to save America from the secular humanists, if you want to, you know, uh, uh, change the world according to what you believe, you know, your religious convictions, make America Christian again, right? Make America great again, you know, or whatever. Um, the foundation of this is the past, right? You know, make America great again is a historical statement, right? A lot of people, I always say this when I give book talks, right? On, on the Believe Me book. Um, a lot of people like to focus on the word great in that saying, right? <laughs> you know, I always, as a historian, zero right in on the word again, right? You know, you tell me what it was like back then and see if you want to go back. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about race, which is huge, but also like, you know, do you really want to go back to a world where, you know, there was no Novocaine or whatever, you know, or there was, you know, or where you had to, you know, light a lamp every day or, you know, those kinds of things. Um, any historian would tell you that, you know, the best time to be living is right now. Right now. Yeah, you know, for a variety of reasons. So, so if you could make an argument, I, I've always said this, if you could argue on this Christian America thing, if you can, if you can make the case that the Christian nationalist historians like Barton and Metaxas are, are wrong about the founding or manipulate history, you know, or whether it be the facts or whatever, you know, then you sort of start taking, you make cracks at the edifice. You start, you start breaking down the foundation and then they have nothing to look back upon. Right. So, so historians have, um, an absolutely essential role in playing, not only just to pursue truth, like any Christian should, right? but, but also to, to kind of challenge these kind of theocratic or, you know, they're going to get mad at me that I use theocratic, right? Because they would say, we're not theocratic, you know, but this, but this false narrative built upon a present day false narrative built upon a false foundation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, speaking of, of Metaxas, uh, Barton, D'Souza, uh, that, those sound like uh, a term you've coined, uh, court evangelicals. Yeah. Um, just walk us through that. Uh, sure. when, when did that come to you? What made you think of it? Yeah. Uh, and what's the status of the term? Sure. Um, I'm very, I'm very precise on the way I use the term. Um, you know, I think people who follow me on Twitter or read my stuff on my blog would think that anyone who likes Trump is a court evangelical. Um, you know, I, I'm, I don't think I've ever written about this, but I'm very concise, right? Mm -hmm. um, the court evangelicals are you know, because so my father voted for Trump, right? But I wouldn't say he's, a, and he's an evangelical. I wouldn't say he's a court. The court evangelicals are the guys who go to the court, the so-called King's Court, the White House, right? <laughs> this, is a, this is drawing upon um, sort of medieval and Renaissance courtiers, right? People who would go to uh, the king for the sole purpose of telling the king what he wants to hear, flattering the king. Uh, a court evangelical never speaks truth to the king, never speaks truth to power. The court, the court, uh, the courtier is there to puff the king up, to make the king feel good, to tell the king what he wants to hear. Um, so I took that sort of medieval Renaissance idea of the courtier, and I applied it to people like Robert Jeffress. Jerry Falwell Jr. Um, Metaxas has been to the White House, so he qualifies. Um, you know, Paula White, 
Franklin Graham and so forth. These people who uh, claim the mantle of Christianity, claim the mantle of, of uh, you know, morality and, and speaking the truth, right? And then they, they refuse to call Donald Trump out for things that he does, whether they be tweets or policies or whatever, that are blatantly immoral, right? So, so you know, where are the court evangelicals today when Donald Trump is retweeting this crazy doctor who's saying that the coronavirus comes from demon seed, you know, that cap in the middle of the night, you know, uh, you know, where, where are they? Where are they saying this is wrong, right? Um, they don't because they don't want to lose. Uh, they see it as a kind of, and to be fair to them, they see it as a larger issue, right? We don't want to lose the president on abortion and religious liberty as they define it, right? Usually religious liberty for their own views, right? Not for Muslims or other people. Um, maybe I'm a little unfair say, saying that, but but I think overwhelmingly when they think about religious liberty, they think about um, themselves. So, so these people go to the court. So I just, I just did a post today. Um, one of the lesser known court evangelicals, an African-American pastor named Daryl Scott, Darryl Darryl Scott. Scott, right? Yes. He just posted a picture on Twitter of him kind of strolling out of the White House. So literally he had to get somebody to stand there and film him doing this, right? Strolling out of the White House with a can of Coke in his hand, wearing a suit and speaking to the camera saying, just got back from the president, talked to the big man, uh, Jared Kushner, hanging out with them, big things coming, big, you know. You know, it's like, what are you doing? Like you're, you're sending a message to your people to show that you have access to power, right? That's it. There's no humility there. There's no, um, you know, it's all about power. Um, and that's, I think, what these court evangelicals are, are, are up to. They love the photo ops. I think one of the first court evangelicals who left, I'm blanking on his name, maybe you remember, an African-American pastor from Brooklyn, mm. who very early on um, said enough. Hmm? Bernard? Is yeah, Bernard. A.R. Bernard, maybe? Or, you know, he said enough, right? And then he, he went all over and said, all this is are photo ops. And, you know, now again, I do think it's more than photo ops. I do think they're influencing Trump on Israel policy. Mm -hmm. I think they're influencing Trump on religious liberty. They've convinced Trump that somehow the Johnson Amendment, right, this, this tax, this part of the tax code that says pastors can't endorse candidates, you know, which I think is a good thing for Christians because they shouldn't be doing this, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, you know, they've convinced Trump that there are these issues and Trump has listened to them because it, he needs their, he needs their, uh, their votes. So he, he, you know, every speech Trump gives to evangelicals is pretty much the exact same speech, right? You know, it's about abortion, it's about the Supreme Court justices, mm -hmm. it's about religious liberty, it's about the Johnson Amendment, right? Um, which by the way, he hasn't done anything with. The Johnson Amendment no. is still on the books, right? So I think these court evangelicals, um, you know, have, have, I don't think it's too strong to say they've kind of sold their souls, they've sold their witness. Their, and, and to me, I come at this as an evangelical myself, who is concerned about the witness of the church. I mean, I don't, Roger Stone just came out and said that he's now had a born again experience, right? I don't want to criticize that. I'm, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to be the guy who says that if he had a real spiritual experience, it's not true. They said that about Charles Colson too, right? And, and that proved, they proved to be wrong, I think. Um, but, but it's just, it amazes me to see that Roger Stone goes on the Eric Metaxas show and there's no clear distinction between his spiritual experience and his political Christian right talking points, right? In other words, I was completely innocent. Everything I did was wrong or was right. I was unjustly accused. I was victimized by Mueller and Bill Barr and... and God saved me, 
right, from this. No repentance, nothing. God save me. And then Metax is just kind of agreeing with them, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that's not a, that's, to me, that's not the marks of, of, of a conversion. And, and that's there different. There seems to be no difference between politics and Christian right politics and a true faith, right? Sure. And that's, that's not what Colson was like. No, Col exactly. You know, he saw what he had done and made a clear statement to that effect. Colson was a broken man. Absolutely. Right? You know, I mean, he, he kind of, you know, fell on the Lord and said, you know, oh my gosh, you know, you know, Stone just looked like he was doing the same thing he did before his conversion. And, and except he now is just baptizing his rhetoric with sort of Christianese, you know, or, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I, th I think that, that, that part of uh, court evangelical concept that you isolate of, of not challenging anything is yeah. is what really distinguishes the that that person from someone who might say well i can't support anybody if they're not pro life right, uh, right. on on abortion because yeah. it's very arguable that the trump is not pro life on many other issues yeah. uh, so if they if that's their yeah. stance uh, they can hold their nose perhaps and do something but but this is this is the individual who comes up with a uh, a story to defend uh, every action yeah. uh, that uh, Trump takes and find some rationale for it, and it, it's not unlike what uh, the the Barton or the D'Souza or the Metaxas does with history, yeah. is they you know rationalize yeah. the uh, facts once they're caught in the the false narrative. Yeah. Then they rationalize it or use language to try to somehow make it still uh, conform to their narrative. I think that's exactly right. Yeah, that's really well put. I never really thought about that, that they're actually doing a sort of version of history with current events, right? They're saying like, no, this is not really what happened or, or just ignoring it, right? Sometimes the silence is just deafening, you know, especially, you know, you know, it took them forever to say anything about Charlottesville or the, 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 Im the immigrant mm. children in cages, right? You know, these advocates of family values, right, mm. uh, are not saying anything, you know, I mean, you know, so, so you have, you know, I, I often refer reference to, you know, the Old Testament prophet Nathan, right, who, 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 uh, you know, goes to David and tells the story about injustice with this farmer and his sheep and so forth. And then David's like, who is this person? Thou art the man, mm. right? You know, where is the Nathans in the evangelical community? They exist, but they don't have access to, um, to They're power. not in the court. They're not, no, they're in, not the in the court. court. Right. Yeah. And then you, you do have, you do have Christians who went into the court, like people like Martin Luther King and others who like went into the court and said, spoke truth to power. That's right. right? Um, you don't have that anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Yesterday, Trump uh, tweets that he did something to um, a fair housing ordinance or regulation. And so you suburbanites yep. can have your dream. Uh, yeah. All those poor people are gonna, not going to be in your hair yeah. anymore. And, and you don't have to be, I was really struck by the word in the tweet, you don't have to be bothered uh, by them. Yeah. And where's the outrage? I mean, any, any, his, uh, first of all, I sometimes wonder if they even understand the, his, the, the historical, you know, the, the history behind that statement, right? Um, you know, but that is a deeply racist trope, right? Redlining, um, you know, who are these lower income people, right? You know, let's, let's, let's try to identify them. And even if it's not an is issue of race, it just seems to be politically stupid, right? In other words, like all the white, all the white working class people that voted for you, uneducated white working class people, they're not invited in the suburbs either. I mean, it just right. is stupid politically too, right. you know, but, but those, those are racist kind of, you know, they're, it's all race baiting, right? It's appealing to kind of the white, the history of the white suburbs, white flight. You know, I did a post on this today where I, where I gave some resources on this. If you want to dig into deeper into what Trump meant by that statement, you know, read Kevin Cruz's book on, on white flight in Atlanta, read um, Ron Rothstein's book, The Color of Law and Redlining. Um, you know, I, 
I think, I think maybe Warren, you're giving them too much credit on this one saying like, well, they're silent. I don't even think they know. There's this, this deep anti-intellectualism. They don't even know that that was a racist trope. That's, you know, as a, as a, as a history educator, that's even more disturbing or maybe equal to be disturbing. Well, it is. And some of the younger ones might not know. Uh, I mean, really, they might not because yeah, they've yeah. not had that. But, you know, people of my generation, yeah. Yeah. we know exactly sure. what that means. I mean, oh, that's yeah. oh, like yeah. 1968, You're right. uh, fair housing. And, you know, everybody, You're right. everybody knew You're right. yeah. uh, what that's all about. It's and, a dog whistle. Oh, absolutely. And yeah. um, that's, if you're from my generation, you hear that. The, the, and the, the people, you're right about that. And the people who know, know better and know that this is a dog whistle um, are the same people who are unwilling to say anything about it. I think largely because they don't want to admit that there's system, it's systemic, that this is systemic racism. Um, I think that is a, I see this not just from the court evangelicals, but even like anti-Trump conservatives who are like unwilling to like acknowledge uh, the idea that systemic racism is real. You cannot study American history without, you know, knowing, I was just telling a bunch of teachers who I'm doing this Gilder Lehrman course on colonial America. We were talking about the way systemic racism sort of informed like colony, the colonies, right? And built off of that. So I think there's this denial to, uh, or this refusal to say, you know, because of whether it's white privilege or fragility or white fragility is now seems to be popular, you know, they're just unwilling to, to accept this idea. Yeah. Now, you mentioned a blog post that you did uh, recently on a topic uh, similar to this. You've uh, been uh, blogging since uh, 2008. Is that, is that right? That sounds right. 12 years. Yeah, we just yeah. had our 12th year anniversary. So we're little, not as, not as much of a veteran as you are. <laughs> but uh, we're up. I mean, people, when you get to 12 years or 15 years of blogging, it's like, it's huge because it's such a, you know, most people don't last that long. Well, I, I wonder where the time has gone. Yeah. And uh, that's a lot of posts. Uh, for me, yep. that's over 5,000 yeah. uh, posts. That's a lot of words. Uh, yep. That could have been a lot of books, but they turned into a lot of blog posts. Yeah. Uh, you uh, uh, have the title of your blog, as we mentioned earlier, The Way of Improvement Leads Home. What's the story behind that? Yeah, I mean, if you want the long, full story, I also host a podcast, and we went, we oh, devoted yeah. episode zero, their first episode, to explaining okay. what that means. But let me give you the, the short elevator version. Uh, first of all, it's the title of my first book. I wrote a book um, uh, about an 18th century young man named Philip Vickers Fithian, one of the more prolific diary writers of uh, colonial America. He's from Southern New Jersey, went to Princeton, uh, was in the class of 1772 with uh, James, uh, with uh, Aaron Burr. James Madison was a year ahead of him, um, then became a Presbyterian minister, was a Revolutionary War chaplain and so forth. So it was a history of this, of this, of this guy. And as I began to, to study him, um, there was always this tension between his passion for home, for place, for his, his birthplace, his family, his faith, his love of roots, and so forth. But he was also among the first generation of men in the 18th century to have the opportunity to be able to rise above, uh, improve himself in a way that took him beyond uh, that rootedness. But he never sort of lost touch with and he would get very homesick for home and you know these kinds of things so his whole life was defined uh through the uh, by the tension between um his his path of education self-improvement so forth and his roots so it's kind of a roots and wings type thing mm -hmm. um so you know his way of improvement uh ultimately led him home right you know back to his back to his hometown and I won't give you the end of the way the end of the book because there is some, some drama in it in case someone wants to wants to buy the book so I, I found that as a kind of really interesting I mean it's 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 clunky right you know the way of improvement leads home but but I found it as kind of a metaphor for not only 
not only um, the way I think about my own life, even, you know, as a working class kid, no, you know, really rooted in a kind of North Jersey local culture growing up, um, then went off to college, you know, and still kind of long for, um, you know, that kind of, you know, ethnic upbringing with large family and, you know, that kind of thing, you know, it's, it's always been a constant tension in my life, you know, as a working class person in, in, a, in academia, you know, it's, it's, you know, I haven't necessarily always conformed to kind of the way my secular colleagues think about their academic lives as a Christian who has a deeply rooted, I hope a deeply rooted faith, you know, that I try to practice, um, but yet at the same time, kind of wanting to pursue an, elect, an intellectual life, right? That tension, what is that? So it's that tension, right? I think that a lot of people can relate to and have relate to once it's explained to them. Like I said, the title's a little clunky, but it's, it's that constant tension that people have. And I think much of what I do is kind of always has that tension in mind, right? That one's road of improvement, as you're improving, as you're becoming more intellectual, cosmopolitan, whatever, um, you don't forget home. Mm. Yeah, that sounds. I, I didn't know all that. That's uh, yeah. that's fascinating. What's the po is the podcast also the same title? Yeah, the podcast is called The Way of Improvement Leads Home Podcast. We've been doing that now for five years. We've had a few changes over the years. I started it with a former student of mine who was a grad student in history who knew everything about the, you know, world, that world, the podcast world and the tech and, the, you know, editing and all of that. Um, he since, we've since separated very amicably he just couldn't didn't have time to do it anymore um and now now it's just me but i also have a uh, a uh, studio a student who works with me as a kind of studio producer who kind of you know fixes things up and gets all the you know edits it all and so forth but we've done 70 we just recorded it with Kristen cobez dume on her book on gender and um It'll be out in a couple of weeks, but it was our 73rd episode. And it's mostly driven by history. You know, I mean, a lot of my blog gets a lot into this kind of evangelical, you know, world and that kind of stuff, you know, David Barton or what's happening at John MacArthur's church or whatever. Um, but, but, um, I've tried to keep this one, and we do American religious history too, right? But I've also tried to make this podcast much more historical. So we we do stuff on the on the founding fathers, on you know stuff that has nothing to do with religion, you know. But as but to me, is a kind of, are kind of interesting historical stories. And the podcast is it always begins with a little commentary by me, sort of sets the stage. I kind of give my opinion, and it's largely like this, kind of interview driven, forty five minutes with the, with a guest who just wrote a book or someone who's you know you know we just had a, a guy talk about how to write history for children hmm. a Smithsonian uh, uh, curator um, you know uh, teachers sometimes come on what's the best way to teach these kinds of things we've had Pulitzer Prize winners and we've had kind of wow. people that you've never heard of before you know <laughs> who've come on and it's it's fun yeah so it's uh, um, and again we, we do have a Patreon page if you ever want to kind of listen and and support us, you know, you can go to the way of improvement leads home on Patreon, um, or just go to my blog, um, you know, because it does cost money to put these things out because right. we try to professionally produce them. And all the money just goes towards, you know, paying my student you know, to be able to do this. So That's I'm not making good. any money on it, Warren. <laughs> yeah. Believe me, I understand that. Yeah, I, know. I get it. Yeah. Uh, so you could find it, uh, a link to it on the blog. Yeah, on the blog. Okay. Yeah, just click support. Yeah, and you can you can help us out. You can pledge, you know, and we have prizes and stuff. You can get a free co signed copy of the book. We have mugs. We have, <laughs> uh, yeah, we have all kinds of stuff, you know, Way of Improvement Leads Home kind of, kind of merchandise you can get there for different levels. It's like PBS, right? Different levels of, <laughs> of support you get. Um, you get a different package, a like gift package. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I have, I, uh, I have a patron as well, but I don't, I don't do much with it, but yeah. it's a, it's a nice platform. All right. Anything, uh, I think we're running out of, out of time. Anything else you want to add? No, this has been fun. This has yeah. been fun. Yeah. And it's, uh, you know, I know you have an audience, I think that will maybe appreciate some of this in a way that, you know, others may not, you know, so I hope that it's, it's useful. I've, what I've discovered 
is uh, I've covered a lot of different subjects. Uganda, uh, sexual identity. Well, you're all over the place. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so what I've discovered is I have about four different audiences. Right. And uh, they, they don't overlap much. So, yeah. so yeah. this has been an interesting experience of having right. some people reconnect Right. Uh, you know, all here together in the last few weeks. Yeah. So I really appreciate you uh, doing this. It's been a great pleasure. All right. I look forward to it. Thanks. All right. Good luck for the semester. Right. Yep. You yeah. too.